cool cucumber. Cool cucumber. <laughs> a very cool cucumber. Welcome to Cool Cucumber TV. Hello and welcome to another beautiful, bountiful edition of Cool Cucumber TV. Treats coming up this time include a visit to Cut at 45 Park Lane and a chat with the great Wolfgang Puck. We talk to John Williams at the Ritz about life in the kitchen and what it's like to be in charge of a legend. The Hendrix Ambassador gives us one last brew up, the Homeward Punch. A quick stop to see how Kerbyshire and Mort in West London have redefined fish and chips. Wolfgang Puck shows us round his latest book. And finally, some quick and easy pasta secrets from Katie Caldesi. Welcome to Cut at 45 Park Lane. We're here to talk to Wolfgang Puck, one of the world's best known chefs, uh, started from Spargo in California and has really become internationally famous over 30 years. We started to expand internationally uh, about three years ago. So we are, my thought was, why only be in America? So we opened our first restaurant outside, really, in Singapore, a cut in Singapore. And then a year ago, we opened here in London, cut mm. there. And I think it's very exciting to be here, and I love it here, and I think... If I would have enough money, I would move to London. <laughs> but your real estate prices are too high here. <laughs> now, in this particular restaurant, how many covers do you have? Well, it's actually a wonderful restaurant. We have two stories. So we have the bar upstairs where you can go and have cocktails, have little appetizers like our little tuna tata sandwiches or your mini Kobe burgers and so on and great cocktails and also great champagne and things by the glass. And then the restaurant is actually fairly small. We only have 75 seats and we do about one and a half turns. So we do about 120 customers a night. Uh, that's about as much as we can fit in here because yeah. unlike uh, in America where everybody thinks six o'clock at night is prime time dinner, here people want to come at 8.30. So, sure. And very few people really come early. Though we have some theater goers now who come because they know they can get their food fast and go to the theater. So. We have some people coming in early, but I think 120 is for us, it's really a very good number. Absolutely. The, uh, the menu is a, it's quite an extensive menu, but it's, it's, it's concentrated. Yeah. Um, I mean, the starters, the crab louise seems to be uh, crab and lobster, isn't it? Louis? Yeah, crab and lobster louise salad is one of our favorites here and also one of our favorites in our restaurant in the U.S., really? which is a salad made with uh, lobster and crab and avocado and a little tomato, a little basil and all bound together, like more like a Thousand Island kind of dressing with... Uh, uh, homemade mayonnaise with a little pickles in it, a little onions in it, some ketchup in it, and a little horseradish, so it makes it a little spicy. And it has become probably our most uh, sold appetizer, that and the tuna tata too. So, and so we have really exciting appetizers, and uh, the meat and the fish is prepared fairly simple. Everything is on the side, the vegetables are on the side, the sauces are on the side. So if you just want to taste the meat, you really get your steak with our special seasoning on it. That's it. Maybe I love french fries and onion rings with it. <laughs> and I dip the french fries in my Bernays sauce and to me that's perfect. But I like to keep the meat really pure. And then we have wonderful desserts from chocolate souffle to banana cream pie and wonderful fruit cobblers now because all the berries are in season also. So it's really a menu where you can get exciting appetizers, interesting side dishes and delicious desserts. But the main focus is on the meat and the meat, if it's great quality, we, wanna, we don't want to mask it, we keep it simple, just grill it. So simplicity is the key. I think to me simplicity is sometimes more difficult than making something sure. complicated because you have to get the best ingredients and try not to mess them up. 
the quality of the ingredients is the most important thing. So if you order a steak, a U.S. prime steak from uh, Creekstone in Kansas, or if you order a steak from uh, a Wagyu steak from Australia, you know you get the finest meat in the world. And we have a great wine list with American wines, a lot of California wines here. So I think it makes a good combination. And we really represent what is best about America. America is well known for its meat mm. and now also for wine. Mm. How about the sourcing of materials? You know, a lot of uh, ingredients we can find here, especially seafood is very easy. You know, we're an island and uh, we have great lobsters, great salt and all that things. And meat, we get some from uh, here, from uh, uh, Scotland. Most of it though, we get from the US from Australia, Chile, or New Zealand. So the beef and lamb we get from here too. So I think we just try to find the best one. And uh, people come here especially for our meat, you know. And I saw that at the beginning, we're gonna sell a lot of fish, we're gonna sell a lot of uh, lobster and so on, but it's very little. People really come here for lunch or for dinner. They love our steaks. What's your total team here? Oh, we, have a, we have actually many employees here. Why? Because we serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So if we have maybe 10 chefs in the kitchen at one time or 12 chefs at one, at one time in the kitchen, but we need chefs for overnight. We have chefs uh, doing breakfast, and I just was down in the kitchen, and the first chef went home because he was here overnight and did breakfast. So all together we have 100 employees in here. Really? So you do prep overnight and... and we do prep overnight, in. but also room service. Like if you check into 45 Park Lane here, if you want room service, you get it from Cut. Mm -hmm. So you, get, uh, you can have the same steaks as we have here. And when uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. was here, he ate his steaks in his room. He thought, oh, I don't want to come down to the restaurant. I have to get dressed up. I'm tired. The same thing with Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt. They stayed here at the hotel and we serve them room service. So it's sure. exactly the same thing as down here at the restaurant. Sure, sure. Well, it's rather nice to have a restaurant like this to call on for room I service. I know, <laughs> I don't say this is a hotel, I said this is a restaurant with room. Sure. <laughs> to me, it is very important that uh, people who worked with me for many years, before I set them out and they become a chef or manager or so on in one restaurant. And like David McIntyre worked for me, uh, with me for 14, 15 years already. He opened Cut in, uh, Beverly Hills and he helped us open a Chinese restaurant and he had his own restaurant for a while and when I asked him if he would like to go to London and he was so excited about it so I said oh he's the right guy. The same thing with Melissa who is uh, our pastry chef. She worked with us since the opening of Cut in Cannes and before that she worked at Spago in Beverly Hills. So they were really already with us for many years and Herbert who is an Austrian guy worked with us for quite some time, so I had a core team already. And then I said, you know, in the dining room, we should have somebody who also knows people here already. So I had Lloyd, Lloyd Lodi come and he worked at Harris Bar and at Hakkasan and all these fancy restaurants here. So I know he's gonna know some of the people I know and he does, so that's a good thing. So it's a good combination of part from here and part from over there. But I think in the cooking part, instead of teaching somebody who doesn't know our style. I had two people, the three people really, who really know my style exactly. It, it seems to have taken off because uh, every time I come here, the place is absolutely packed. Yeah, no, I think we are very excited. We are full every night. We are sold out every night. So it's really a great thing. We have a great Sunday brunch now, which is fairly new. We have a little music playing. And I just got here yesterday and I said, oh, that's fun to hang out, have a little jazzy music, and have Sunday brunch, have a glass of champagne, or an interesting Bloody Mary. John Williams, chef de cuisine at the Ritz, um, probably pinnacle of your career and probably the most important hotel job uh, in this country. And the kitchen itself is, is a glory. It's one of those few kitchens that has all the points of uh, Escoffier's uh, discipline, if you like. How many, how many people do you have working here? I've got 58, Roy. 58. And it's probably, in actual fact, as a hotel, it's probably the most aspirational hotel there is. People queue up and want to come inside and take photos. Sure. Whereas, you know, there's not many hotels where that will happen. Sure, sure. 
Sure. And, and the departments in the kitchen you have? Departments, uh, well, we've, within the pastry, we've got three um, full-time departments, and then we've got the bakery. So there's an area for ice creams, chocolates, the plated desserts, and our afternoon tea, mm -hmm. and then the actual bakers themselves who work at night. Mm -hmm. In the larder, we've got another three departments, one for the afternoon tea sandwich. We have a, a snack area, which is the room service, you know, the sandwiches and things for the room service. Then we have the hors d'oeuvre, which is for the, the main restaurant and uh, banqueting. Mm. Saucier, taking care of all the meat, poultry and game. Poissonnier, taking care of all the fish and shellfish. Entremetier and garnish, they're taking care of all of the vegetable dishes, the farinaceous, ravioli, risotto, that type of thing. And then we have a breakfast, a staff cook, and then we have a, a butcher and himself, the sous chefs. So there's quite a few bits of breakdown, as it were. But in a kitchen like this, where you have, you, you have to remember, we are the only hotel left that actually is cooking, or shall I say the deluxe hotels or palace style hotels, that are actually taking care of all of their own food and beverage. And I'm very proud of that. Mm. I mean, I'm, of course I'm proud to be at the Ritz. I'm, you know, as I say, it, it's a very aspirational hotel and it's something that I've always wanted to do. Mm. Cooking here, you know, it, it's nice. Well, the, the exciting thing about it is the volume you do as well. And of course, you are based on tradition. I mean, your menu is very traditional, yeah. with some modern touches, but you've stuck to what everyone regarded as, as the grand cuisine. I mean, you are the, oh, yes. you know, you're at the pinnacle of that. Yeah, I think inside me, right from the start, I've always wanted to cook uh, very expensive products. I, and it's not because I'm trying to be uh, pompous or anything like that. It just, that, that was drawn to me. And I've always worked in uh, grand hotels. But the, the real interesting thing is having this product in front of you. I couldn't do that as an individual restaurateur. Sure. The expense would be too much. Sure. Truffles I love, yeah. you know, I love lobster, I love foie gras. Yeah. You know, all of these ingredients are very special yeah. in the Ritz kitchens. Mm. And it should be, mm. because, you know, it's about haute cuisine. I'm still about haute cuisine. I believe in tradition, I believe in classic cuisine, and that's the way it should be. But, you know the interesting thing, Roy, I'm now 53. I really believe at 50, you come to a point where you become, not blinkered, but you're very religious in what you believe is good and bad. Mm. And I am very religious like that now. The, the difference is, I like to use my young cooks mm. who are actually using a lot of modern technology to help us maintain the modern, the modern type of cuisine that is needed. But its roots in every single cause is classic. That's fantastic. So a great place for people to train. You must have a queue Without of people. Doubt. <laughs> Without doubt. In actual fact, that's better and better because people, you know, they'll come online now mm. and ask you for jobs. So, of course, you, you keep ahead mm. with the staffing situation and you can be a little bit more choosy. Mm. And as the, the Ritz's reputation has actually lifted, mm. we get a better class of people wanting you to come and work here. Mm. What happens, do you feel, do you feel slightly put out by the fact that here you are training in a traditional sense, you're giving a wonderful service to the hospitality industry, uh, and then they, they up and leave and go somewhere else? Uh, or is that part of what one has to, is, is no, evolution? You, you, you know, to? there's nothing gives you greater pleasure than you actually seeing, I, I, I've got a big apprenticeship, uh, apprenticeship scheme here mm -hmm. within the academy, it works very, very well, there's nothing better than for to see someone that you actually see in 10 years time probably becoming better than you. Sure. I've got cooks at this moment in this kitchen who I'm very proud to say, and people know that I speak about them. Mm. I say, this guy is going to be very, very special. Mm. They will be better than me because their knowledge is so much bigger now. Mm. You know, the way they access knowledge, the way they actually cook is, you know, beyond what we ever did. Mm. We actually did everything with touch, feel, palette and it was all to do with the senses these guys are a bit more technical sure. you know it's to the nth degree sure. in temperatures and how they will actually cook so they will become more precise sure. so I just say good luck to them they will get better and take my hat off to them but if I've had something to do with their training and development 
I should be happy, shouldn't I? Absolutely. That's a very good answer. Now, this is an extraordinarily busy place. And afternoon tea, everyone talks about at the Ritz, of course, but you have a, a very busy dining room. And as well as private, uh, private rooms you cater for, how many people in a normal day? Well, the teas, uh, you know, on certain periods for the afternoon tea, you have to book six months in advance. Really? Yeah. We do some 400 covers a day. It averaged last year 394 per day. That's extraordinary. It, it's a great business. You know, people want to come and celebrate afternoon tea. Yeah. It's all celebration. Yeah. Everybody that comes for afternoon tea are celebrating something. So it's a fantastic thing. Well, the Ritz is a place to celebrate, I suppose, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, 100%. And, and dining room? Oh, the dining room, we do up to 120 covers. Um, but generally speaking, I say we average 80 covers uh, per session, yeah. which is, you know, it's fantastic. Because when I actually came here, the, the covers were not so, not so high. Yeah. And we've built up a much better reputation. Mm -hmm. the, a great story, when I arrived, um, the first couple of weeks I was here, there was um, a situation where I was totally unhappy with the service, uh, you know, the, the food wasn't quite right. And it always had this um, fame for the wonderful dining room that we have, and it's the most beautiful dining room. And the chef was always compared with the dining room and the food not being up to the, the class of the dining room. Sure. And I was particularly not happy this particular lunch, so I took the whole brigade, I said, right, come here. And they all trotted upstairs. We walked into the dining room. I said, have a look at this. Have a look at that ceiling. Is your food good enough to be served into that room? And you know how chefs go, way chef. The whole brigade went, way chef. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I've got a reaction there. Yeah, yeah. But it was something that was very, very important to me sure. because I didn't want to be another also run where people would say his food is not good enough to serve in the Ritz, and that's very important. Going back to the style, the style is actually dictated by the room. Mm. So we also have to be very careful about what we put on the plate. Those are so important in the Ritz for me. John, thank you very, very much indeed for your time. Thanks. You're most welcome. So now I'm gonna make the uh, Homewood Punch. This was a drink that was devised by uh, a guy called Henry Besant from the Worldwide Cocktail Club. It's all based on ingredients from the Homewood Gardens. So lots of fresh herbs and ingredients in there. And of course, it's based on gin. So firstly, iceberg size device. So, now, Rather than measuring in small quantities, we don't need this. We're going to measure by the jar. So, jar of Hendrix gin. So, half a jar freshly pressed lemon juice. And then another half a jar of a combination of different um, British liqueurs. So I'm going to use a little bit of elderflower, some raspberry, and a tiny dash of blackcurrant. So quite a healthy measure of raspberry. Probably half of this portion will be raspberry, so about a quarter of a jar. And then the other two made up of elderflower and blackcurrant, like so. So, mash that in there. Now, from what we picked earlier with Roy, we've got this lovely Lovage, which has got such a beautiful fragrance. We'll have lashings of that, excuse the pun and borage, which is a really wonderful ingredient. It works beautifully with gin. Subtle, it's quite light, floral, really beautiful fragrance. So we'll chuck some borage in there as well. Okay. 
Also, for good measure, measure a little bit of verbena, a little bit of lemon balm. Two. Now we top it off with some English sparkling wine. So in this case, I'm using Ridgeview. It's nice and dry. About a third of a bottle. So we'll just give that a nice stir, just to infuse the flavours from the, the herbs, the lovage, the borage, the mint. And then, serve that up. Mrs Paisley style. In a nice teacup. Like so. Hello, darling. You're just in time. Let me just get you a little garnish. I'm going to throw in some borage from Joe's garden. And this is the Mrs. Paisley's Lashings Homewood Punch. Thank you very much. That looks beautiful. Doesn't it look nice in this cup? You've made half of that drink. That's half of that is ingredients Whoa. from your garden. That's your lovage, that's your mm. borage, that's it's your mint. It's very nice. But um, I think maybe it's a bit too strong for me. Often held as London's best fish and chip shop, Kerbyshire and Mort treat fish and chips with the care and respect for cooking and ingredients that you'll find in the very best restaurants. No silver service, but well worth a visit. I trained at Leeds School of Food and Wine, and then I went to the Oxford Tower restaurant. I uh, worked there for five years. And from there I went to a scene with Henry Harris, at which point me and Nick decided to start a fish and chip shop. And so from there I started my research into fish and chips from fine dining. Worked in several fish and chip shops around the country. Went on to some potato farms, went on to a uh, fishing boat, um, see how they catch all the fish. We thought that we had a really good idea. We thought we had a really good product. Um, we were confident in what we were doing. There's several well-known um, and renowned fish and chip shops in London. And they have a very long reputation. Um, but in most local areas in London, fish and chips have sort of been taken over by kebab houses and even Chinese takeaways. And we just felt that it had been neglected a little bit in London's sort of villages. We've actually put a CCTV camera in the, in, in, in the restaurant. Um, so there's a live feed from the kitchen out to the restaurant so people can actually see um, us cooking their food. Um, so there is still a connection. We've got cod, pollock, coley, place and haddock. We wanted to put pollock and coley on, and haddock obviously as a replacement for cod because of the sustainability issue. Um, and place, we have it on the menu because it's obviously a, an alternative to a white flaky fish. Cod still does sell, sell the most. Uh, I think, as I say, fish and chips being so traditional, people are so used to um, ordering sort of systematically, they've made their decision already before they come into the restaurant that that's what they want to eat. Um, and often people will come in, they'll have a look at the menu um, out of interest, but they'll still order what they've grown up ordering, um, which is great, you know. But we are still getting customers that are coming in and are happy to try and work their way through the menu and try the different qualities of fish. We use rapeseed oil here because I think London has such a diverse clientele that um, we would be negating the vegetarian market uh, quite heavily if we use beef dripping. Um, we do want to try and keep our food as healthy as possible. We have quite a varied menu as well. We have other options other than fish and chips, uh, like calamari and white bait and fish finger butties, which is sort of like old school traditional. Um, and people come in just for, for that, and then they'll come in for their fish and chips at a later time in the week. A fish and chip shop is set up to do solely fish and chips. So the process of cooking fish and chips, although I may have been, may bring a restaurant knowledge to the industry, I don't think I'm doing restaurant food. I'm just doing, you know, fish and chips the way it should be done, really. From fine dining, absolutely, it's a different discipline. Working with fish is working with fish, whether it be fine dining or not. You know, we still buy our, our fish fresh from Billingsgate. You know, the prepping of the fish is done through my chef training. I think we just want to keep, keep on doing what we're doing and um, possibly open another one in uh, another area similar to where we have at the moment, uh, uh, if we're lucky enough to do so.
Good day. Another cookery book. How many, how many have you done? This is my sixth cookbook. Uh -huh. So I'm going to do one more right now. I'm working on one of eating healthy and simple and fresh and exercise too. Because I started to exercise. Uh -huh. I'm a better tennis player now than I was 20 years ago. And I'm thinking actually going to Wimbledon. <laughs> because I think if you eat right and you exercise, you really can function until you're 120. Sure. That's what my son tells me. Papa, you're going to live until 120. And I said, you're right. Well, I'll sign up for that. Yeah. <laughs> tell me about this one. Well, this one is a cookbook really made for the home cook. Uh -huh. You know, I saw a lot of this chef's cookbook have recipes which go on and on and on and on with 100 ingredients. This one is really very simple. So it has recipes with five, six ingredients. I even have some recipes where you don't use stocks, for example. If you want to make a sauce for your steak, just use a little hoisin or a little barbecue sauce, a little cream, a little wine, some pepper or mustard, and you make a delicious sauce. Because if I go home at night, I don't have stock in my refrigerator. I don't want to make a stock either. So I think it's easy just to improvise. And I think this cookbook has everything you need but in a simplified version, yet it has great flavor. Because for me, the most important thing is that it tastes good. And what inspired you to write it? Because you wanted to get your knowledge out to people. I think so too. I really want, especially in America, you know, where so many, so few people really cook at home. Most of the people order food out or get fast food, you know, and I want people to be able to do something delicious at home without costing too much money. So you don't see truffles and foie gras and things in this book because people really cannot buy that. Sure. So not too much mise en place or preparation. Yeah, yeah you look, simple. look at the ingredients. So here you have ribs, you have a few ingredients. Most of the recipes have like a very small amount. But if you look at some of the new cookbooks, you know, you have here, look at that. Yep. So you have always five, six, I try to keep it to five, six ingredients. Uh -huh. So that way it makes it simple. Right. You have vegetables, Asian inspired dishes. Look at that, here we have a fancy pork chop with hoisin sauce and dried cranberries. So, and it has how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight ingredients with uh, salt and pepper. Sure, sure. So it's not a lot. These are lamb chops, we do it chinois style, where they marinate them. The lamb shanks. That's a dish that's gone around the world. Huh? That's a dish that's gone around the world. I know. Lamb shakes and short ribs are probably. Yeah. The Moroccan lamb. Chili, very famous in America. So I've never really got to understand chili um, in, in something like that. But I'm going to try that. Okay. okay, you have to try it. It's really, it's spicy a little bit. It's like if you like goulash, for example, where yeah, I come from, they have goulash. Yeah. And that's like the... Latin version of a goulash. You see that in Mexico or in Latin America they have chili, right. or in Texas and yeah. New Mexico. So that's their answer for chili. I think they probably used our recipe and add more cumin to it <laughs> <laughs> and cilantro. So I think that's really a good way to start out. When you really think like here, you have a beautiful pepper steak. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. With raisins in here, so it has sweet and spiciness, but. Again, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ingredients, yeah, yeah. including the meats or the pepper. So you can actually, when you look at that, I said, that I can do at home. Keep it simple. And that's what it, I made this cookbook for, for the home cook. It's not to impress a professional chef somewhere, you know, and say, oh, you know what, this is amazing. Yeah, nobody can do it as well as I can. This is for the people at home. Uh -huh. yep. Where can you buy this? You know, you can get it at Amazon. Okay. Amazon.com. Okay. And here in, in, in the UK, uh, I don't think the stores have it. No, it's, but in the Dorchester, you can get this in the shop? You can get it at the Dorchester, you can get it at a cut okay. right here at our restaurants. Oh, yeah, right. absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And thank you for um, signing it. Okay. So we um, better offer one of these as a, as a prize, I think, for someone. All right, um, well, you try it out at home when you invite me, you surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I bring the wine. <laughs> You're done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
La Cucina Caldesi, our cookery school. Fantastic. Right, you've got, you've got different courses here. We have lots of different courses. We have course, courses to teach children. We have courses to teach adults. Uh -huh. Some courses are aimed more at intermediates, but generally the courses are open to everybody. Okay. So they can all muck in and have a go at cooking. And those that have never cooked before will be led through carefully and those that have been cooking for years always have something to pick up from the courses. That's tremendous. So they get chance to prepare it over there on those work tables and then bring it over here and cook it with That's you. right. What we tend to do is we put the tables in a big um, square in the centre of the room and do our mise en place, then bring it over here as if you're in a real kitchen and we cook our own lunch together. So tremendous. everyone gets a turn in making risotto or fresh pasta or something like that. That's very nice. So people needn't be put off that it's too, too advanced a level. No, absolutely not. We, we mix the levels together because it just seems that it, it works that way. Fantastic. So you're going to cook as a simple pasta dish? I am. Something that you might want to do coming home after a few drinks or um, coming home after a long day at work and you just want to knock up something very quick at home. Uh -huh. So in the time it takes for the pasta to cook, you can make yourself a simple sauce out of things that perhaps you have in your cupboard at home, some parsley, garlic, mm -hmm. a bit of fresh chilli or it could be dried chilli flakes. Right, tell, so, me about, tell me about the chilli, because some people are a bit frightened about the chilli, well, using I went, fresh chilli. Well, I went to a chilli workshop, um, mm -hmm. which was fascinating actually. I always put quite a lot of extra virgin olive oil in, right. because that is the sauce. There's no cream or right. um, sort of cheesy sauce or anything like that. That is what's going to coat your olive oil, coat your spaghetti. Sure. And it's extra virgin olive oil, very good for you, full of, full of um, polyphenols antioxidants extremely good uh -huh. chili as i learned on my chili workshop this the heat is not in the seeds but in the pith right so i don't worry about adding seeds to to the dish aesthetically you might not want seeds in it but it's not going to make any difference to the heat whatsoever right so i'll just chop a little bit up it is important however to taste it because as we all know chilies come through particularly fresh ones and you never know if they're going to be hot or not How hot, yeah. So if I keel over, you know it's... I'll um, be ready for you. <laughs> mm, no, it's good. Yeah. Good pecan, but it's not, um, not overwhelming. So I'm going to put that in. Get my oil hot. Um, and fry up some garlic. The chilli. The heat comes through later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just got through, it? Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be putting pepper in this one. Oh, OK. Um, OK. So, simple, simple dish, and also incredibly cheap sure. to do. So, there's our garlic going in. I love simple pasta dishes, I, I really do. So do I. I mean, so many of them are pasta that are a simple sauce that's cooked in the time it takes for the pasta to cook in the water. And sure. So, you, you can't really have fast food any quicker than that. 11 mm. minutes and you've got yourself a meal. Sure. Um, and I think sometimes the simple things are the best, aren't they? I've heard that before, and I agree with you entirely. <laughs> a lot of Italian cooking is incredibly simple, but it does rely on good ingredients, I think. I went to um, Amalfi recently, and we had aqua pazza, the fish in tomatoes, Lovely. and that's literally what it was. Yeah. Fish straight fish from the sea, oh. into the pan oh. with fresh tomatoes. Love it. But wonderful tomatoes yeah, yeah. and wonderful yeah. fresh fish. Seasonal, yeah. absolutely. Seasonal, exactly. Right on. So, very right good on. pinch yeah. of salt. Yeah. And we always tell people to salt like an Italian mama over here. Yeah. Once is... they cut across the threshold, they're in Italy. Uh -huh. Generously. Yeah. Because you want your food to taste. Yeah. We've got a, a pot of big boiling water here. So, sorry, a big pot of boiling water. So there's plenty of room for the linguine to move around in there. There's plenty of salt in here as well. Is that important for the pasta? Give it plenty of room. Yeah, plenty so of space. So not too small a pan. You don't need any oil in there. No, no. It's just lots of room and lots of salt as well. Okay. And most of that salt will stay in the water as you drain the pasta out. Okay. But the pasta will taste of something. That's the important thing. So, set this off the heat for a second. This is the bit that I wanted to... Mm -hmm. Take the pasta from here. Looks good as it is, doesn't it? Okay. Mm -hmm. so if I can put that in there, then I can be bringing this out of here, excuse what I mean. Right, so the pasta is ready in the pot. Take it out. It doesn't matter if a little bit of the cooking water comes with it. That's a good thing. And then just move it around in here. I'm going to shake it. And I'm going to toss it together. And this is so, so important 
that the pasta and a little bit of the pasta water, the pasta can finish off cooking in the oil. Mm. And while it's finishing off cooking, it's going to absorb all that amazing flavour. If you can't do this tossing of the frying pan action, then simply move it around. Right. But it's so important to put the pasta into the sauce and not the sauce onto the pasta. Okay. And that should now be done and ready to eat. Very simple, isn't it? Yeah. So I want to grate some cheese over it. Am I going to get myself a bowl? Yes. Mmm, wonderful alfredo. Lovely flavour, so simple. And the pasta is right on, right on. So we've got nice plastic topped tongs. Maybe not the most beautiful thing in the kitchen, but at least that means that I can get my pasta out without it falling everywhere. Mm. And then just twirl it into the dish to serve it nicely. A few little chilies on top. Mm. And some cheese. Just wanted to put a little bit of cheese on there. Got some good grana padana here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to grate that on top. It's nice and soft, so I rather like this sort of creamy texture. Right, one for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Buon appetito. Grazie. Mmm. Mmm. I love that. Do people, are people that are sort of slight, still slightly worried about cooking pasta and overcooking mm. it? Yeah. Yes, definitely, yes, yeah. Is I'm there an optimum worry, time? Yes. Or, or depends obviously on the shape of the pasta. Um, well, we use Dicecco much mm. of the time, and, um, or any good Italian brand of pasta, and it will say how long to cook it for. And they've done so many tests that you can really trust them. So if it says, linguine number seven, cooking time 11 minutes, it really means 11 minutes. Right. So um, Italians do prefer their pasta more al dente than we tend to have it over here, but you can, you can see, you can test a bit to be absolutely sure, but I think they're fairly reliable actually in their cooking times. But also, I would rather take it out of there when it still needs some cooking and finish it in here. Mm. So maybe take it out at nine minutes and allow it to cook for two minutes in the sauce. Absolutely delicious, thank you very much. Good, indeed. you're very welcome. Thank you. To do a little name drop. Last time I was in your kitchen, it was uh, with HRH Prince Charles, <laughs> who was uh, here for Mutton Renaissance. Yeah. Now that was an interesting thing. Is that still still was thriving? Oh yeah, that's still going. You know, and we have to actually say thank you uh, to the Prince of Wales for that because it was his initiative. He came to us in the academy as patron. He said, "Look, I'm patron. Now you have to work for us." And what he actually said, he said, look, the farmers need some help. They're not getting money for the sheep. They're not getting money for the fleeces. We need to do something. And mutton is something that he was actually very, very passionate about. He said, we forgot what mutton tasted like. But we also had forgot what it tasted. It tasted like in the sense of why it was the, the distinctive flavor. But there was another little factor, of course. Even the farmers were arguing with us and butchers of what the specification was. So we really had to give a new specification to mutton in its own right. And one of ours, uh, there was a few basic rules. Four front teeth, so that the, the, the mutton or the, the sheep could actually be uh, finished on grass. This is very, very important because if it's not finished on grass, the flavor is no good. We also wanted a very specific age, and we chose around a two year age. That give a, a very, very specific kind of flavour. The last thing that I want to actually make sure, that there was a natural maturation of hanging. And that had to be done naturally. And then we actually said, we will then call it, you know, providing that it was coming from a reputable farmer, of course, we would then call it a Renaissance mutton. And I must, uh, you know, I think it's very important. We were the vehicle, but it was the Prince of Wales and his idea and his foresight of how it was actually going forward. That was the important thing. Cool cucumber. Yeah.